Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam Ala nabiyyana Muhammad Wa ala alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam Amma bad Ahabate fi Allah Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi Wa barakatuh Hayyakum Allah jami'an Continue on in our study of Bulugh Maram Kitab al-Jami' The comprehensive book We reach the hadith 1282 in the chapter, chapter number four, warning against evil conduct. And again, this is the group of ahadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Imam Ibn Hajr al-Asqalani, rahmatullahi alayhi rahmatin wasi'ah, that he put in this chapter of warning against evil conduct. So these are these characteristics, or these are the characteristics that are madhmum. These are the characteristics which are sinful that the mu'min should avoid. So this is a warning, a stern warning against that conduct which we do not wish to possess, to, to possess as the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Alaihi Wasallam did not possess those characteristics and warned against those characteristics. So all of these ahadith, they are ahadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam warning ijtinab to avoid uh, those ahadith uh, those uh, characteristics which are unbefitting for the mu'min. Narrated Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, there are three signs of a hypocrite. When he speaks, he lies. When he makes a promise, he breaks it. And when he is trusted, he betrays his trust. Mutafakun alayhi, Bukhari and Muslim also reported the hadith of Abdullah bin Amr with this uh, addition and when he quarrels he abuses it uh, he abuses meaning he assault, insults others in this hadith of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we understand that this is a hadith which contains those various characteristics that we want to avoid that these are wicked characteristics and conduct that is unbefitting for the mu'min. And on top of that, these this hadith outlines hypocrisy uh, amali. This hadith shows or defines those traits which are not only befitting for the believer but they constitute hypocrisy. And as is known to the ulama, that hypocrisy is of two types. Hypocrisy, uh, hypocrisy or nifaq, uh, nifaq uh, akbar, when nifaq asghar. You know, there's the major hypocrisy and there's the minor hi hypocrisy. And the major hypocrisy, that takes you out of the fold of Islam. Meaning, this is uh, those acts of hypocrisy that are qalbiya, uh, you know, hip hypocrisy in the heart. Whereas these, this hadith outlines hypocrisy, amali, those hypocr that uh, the form of hypocrisy, which is minor but still from a ma major sins. But however, they do not expel one from the fold of Islam. And the traits that are outlined in this hadith, as the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, he said there are three signs of a, a hypocrite. So the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam said, <coughs> Ayatul munafiq thalatha. He said the signs of a hypocrite are three. And he said, first, when he speaks, he lies. Letting us know what? Lying is one of the traits of, a, uh, of hypocrisy and a trait of the hypocrites. When he makes a promise, he breaks it. And that breaking our promise, what is a type of hypocrisy? And when he is trusted, he betrays his trust. And when he's given a trust, he betrays it. Uh, and so this shows us that those three characteristics, which are madhmum, which are major sins are all from the traits of hypocrisy. 
and that the mu'min should avoid them at all cost. Some of the uh, benefits we gain from this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam is we first see that this hadith is a stern warning against lying. This hadith is a stern warning against lying. And that lying, of course, as we mentioned, is one of the major sins. And it is a trait which is madhmum. And that's why we see it in this uh, group of ahadith. And that this is a trait of nifaq. And it is something uh, which lets us know in general, that lying is something sinful. The scholars, they mention, though, that there are particular times, there are exceptions to when something is not, it's not sinful and it is not considered uh, really lying. Or basically, if there is a sharia maslaha if there is a uh, sharia benefit. For example, when the husband and wife are uh, fighting and having conflict uh, between a husband and wife, and if by, as we would say in English, stretching the truth, or in fact, it would be uh, lying, that this would bring a sharia benefit, meaning the family would come back together, that the husband and wife would begin speaking to one another or not making hajar from one another or whatever the case may be, then this is a sharia uh, objective. And so a, a clear example would be, for example, a husband and wife angry with one another and then a third party that intervenes and they say, you know, she said about you that you're a really wonderful husband and that you are one of the best people that she's ever been acquainted with, with and she really was only upset for such and such reason, okay? But maybe this wasn't true. Maybe she didn't say any of these things to the person, but this softened the heart. The husband said, oh, wow, okay. And likewise, are going to the husband and saying, you know, she's uh, to, are going to the uh, wife and saying, you know, he said this and this and this, and in fact, he was going to bring you a gift and... I didn't want to share this information, you know. So again, this is a Sharia objective. And then they actually come back together. Then this is attaining a, a greater objective, a, a positive, good outcome. Not meaning lying in general uh, is a means to every kind of righteous objective. No, but meaning that there are exceptional cases when the, uh, to uh, this when it would not be considered from hypocrisy, nor would it be considered sinful. Another uh, benefit of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam is this also, this hadith shows us that it is impermissible, muharram, to uh, not fulfill our promises. So very important when we make a promise to someone that we should uh, fulfill it. And likewise, this hadith shows us that it is also from hypocrisy and sinful to be deceptive and that this is one of the most wicked forms of hypocrisy and uh, one of the most wicked traits of hypocrisy is that a person uh, they are deceptive and this is and we know this because the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said either atuminna khana the Prophet ﷺ said, and when he uh, makes a, a promise or a uh, trust, he is deceptive regarding it. Or he, you know, he breaks it. He's deceptive. He doesn't give, fulfill his trust. And so this is uh, a trait that we have to avoid at all costs. And one thing when we reflect on these traits of hypocrisy, we see how common these uh, traits are 
amongst humanity and that many of the people take them as light characteristics, as something very simple and something uh, easy and easy to do to break promises, to break trust and not fulfill the trust and uh, that were given to them or to, to violate the trust or to be deceptive or just to lie. This is so easy for so many people because they don't really reflect on the implications. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. And in the next hadith, or in the, the hadith following that which was also narrated in Bukhari and Muslim, reported the hadith of Abdullah ibn Amr with this addition, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, or Abdullah ibn Umar, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, uh, with this addition, and when he quarrels, he abuses, he insults others. So this is also a very important trait that we need to uh, give attention to. And so this additional, this addition in this hadith shows us to not be excessive in our argumentation. Meaning to go to Jawz al Had, to go beyond the bounds. And that means when a person is arguing with someone else, that there are limits. You know, argumentation should not lead to physical fighting and killing. And argumentation should not lead if the person, maybe they're having a knowledge based discussion initially and in some sort of debate or whatever the case may be. And then the person feels that they're losing and their desires creep into it. And so they begin to insult the other person. They begin to talk about their physical characteristics. And so this is what the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was warning against, that this is one of the signs of a hypocrite. So it shows us how serious and how grave this import is that when a person is having a, a knowledge-based debate or discussion or whatever the case may be, or they're arguing with someone that they should not go beyond the bounds, begin to attack their uh, person and abuse them. Well, you're just this. Look at you like this. Your people are like this. Racism. All kind of other uh, ways in which people abuse one another. Because the one who abuses like this, they're the one who exhibits what? They're exhibiting the hypocrisy. They've taken it to another level and they have uh, taken it to a great sin. So the Prophet ﷺ warned us against this wicked trait, this wicked characteristic of being insulting uh, and abusing people. And how many people do we see, unfortunately, having this trait, considering themselves refuting someone, for example, which is completely permissible uh, in the religion of Islam. That we have to uh, let one another know or let the community know when there's a mistake. If someone is teaching something and they've made a mistake, we can maintain the person's honor and we can discuss their mistake, especially when we're talking about Ahl Sunnah. We're talking about Baina Ahl Sunnah, between Ahl Sunnah. And even if you're dealing with the person of innovation who's Asul, their foundation in their understanding of Islam is innovated. They have innovated in innovations, a lot of bid'ah in their beliefs. It is not necessary to begin to talk about their lineage or their racial makeup or their looks or whatever the case may be. This has no place in the discussion. You are dealing with them on an issue of the deen. For example, they've made a mistake. So the refutation is okay, but it should be knowledge-based. It should not be filled with statements of insults. So-and-so is an ignoramus. So-and-so is such and such. So-and-so is such and such. So this is a reminder for you and I, especially those people who are involved in da'wah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that they have to be cautious about their tongue and what they say, even about people who are worthy of refuting, who have cross the line or who have a foundation of bid'ah, that it, 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 it's very serious that we have to be cautious about uh, excessive abuse 
and being abusive, and especially when arguing about something. As the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned in the context of this hadith. In the next hadith, hadith 1283, narrated Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, reviling a Muslim is disobedience to Allah and fighting with him is kufr. Uh, this is a hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, the hadith of uh, Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Sabab al-Muslim fusuq. That cursing a Muslim, it's a type of fisk. It's fusuq. It's a wicked sin. So it would be probably more appropriate, not just that it's disobedience, but it's, you know, what probably encapsulates, encapsulates the, the, the meaning here is that it's, it's a wicked sin. It's very strong. Fasuk, you know, fasik. So by cursing a Muslim or slandering a Muslim, this is fisk. This is fasuk. This is something avin. It's a very uh, great uh, sin. It's wicked. And fighting him is a type of kufr. So. In this hadith, this hadith mentions uh, a few points, a few points that need to be uh, highlighted in this hadith. Fasuk. Fasuk habit This refers refers to al khuruj an ta'a. Al khuruj an ta'a. In that it refers to leaving obedience. Obedience to who? Obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, fisk, when you're leaving disobedient, uh, obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that means you're disobedient. And it is, it's also azim, it's something very great. It's very great to disobey your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala, who has his right over you, which is to worship him and him alone. That means you're violating the purpose of your creation there. Not meaning you've left ta'a you, you've gone to total disobedience or you've gone to kufr, but meaning that you're disobe disobedient to your Lord. You've done a wicked sin. And that's something we need to avoid. Uh, another important term here, and fighting a Muslim. Kital al-Muslim. That this is uh, kufr. This is a type of uh, of uh, disbelief and what we need to do is look in the context of this hadith and we'll get to that point very shortly one of the main benefits of this hadith is this shows the importance of respecting the rights of other Muslims you know, their rights and their honor, their honor and their rights, and that it's an obligation. Ihtiram, Erd al Muslim, Wujubin. That it is an obligation to respect the honor of one another as believers. Inam al Mu'minun, Ikhwa. Verily, the, the, the believers are brothers. And brothers have to be respectful of one another's honor. Another benefit of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam is this hadith also shows that fisk here is dunu kufr. This is fisk which does not take you out of the fold of Islam. Okay? And we, we talked about this, that this is a, a serious sin that we have to avoid uh, by any means, by trampling the honor of one another and, and, and cursing one another. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us that uh, fighting a Muslim is kufr. Fighting a Muslim is kufr. Now, this is imperative that we look at this and we, we have to understand 
the meaning of that because some of Ahl al-Bid'ah will say that this means the one who has fought a, a Muslim, he is a disbeliever. But in fact, this is the kufr dunu kufr. This is the lesser kufr. And the Prophet ﷺ used the word kufr here. But this is a lesser form of disbelief. That this is the kufr, laysa kufr al-makhraj an al-millah. This is not the disbelief which leads, uh, it takes one out of the fold of Islam. And what's the delil for that? What's the evidence? How, wh how can I just make this claim? We make this claim, and the ulama, the ulama, they make this claim, and we understand this because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, fi kitab al-kareem, وَإِن طَائِفَتَانِ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ اقْتَطَلُوا فَأَصْلَحُوا بَيْنَهُمَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِلَىٰ آخْرَىٰ آيَةً He said that if two parties from amongst the believers fight, then rectify between them. And the shahid, or the point here, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described them as mu'mineen. So meaning, yes, sometimes the mu'mineen would fight between one another. And that we should rectify between them. But that fighting does not take them out of the fold of Islam. Even though this is an act of the minor kufr of fighting your brother. So it's very important for us to know and have understanding of this. Otherwise, there would be so many people who had left the fold of Islam. Whole armies and nations because of their fighting one another. But it also shows us to not take this matter lightly, that this is a, one of the major sins. And that's why the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam referred to it as uh, kufr. And that brings up the last fa'idah or um, point of this hadith and benefit of this hadith, which is that it is haram to curse a Muslim and is haram to fight a Muslim and that fighting a Muslim is a'zam, is greater. Physically fighting them is greater than even uh, uh, to curse them and their honor. And those are the main benefits of that hadith. And in the next hadith, hadith 1284, narrated Abu Huraira, رضي الله تعالى عنه والله Messenger صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم said avoid suspicion for indeed suspicion is the worst of false speech متفق عليه and there's a longer version of the hadith uh, also in Bukhari in Muslim and so here the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم said إياكم وظن beware of suspicion for verily, suspicion is the worst of speech. The Prophet ﷺ, uh, uh, mentioned that it's the worst of false speech because when you have suspicion, suspicion begins in the heart and then it manifests itself through actions. And this is a very important point that we're going to get into uh, when we talk about some of the fawah and some of the benefits uh, of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And so, uh, what we learn here and the reason for this hadith being in this bab, in this chapter, tarheeb min masawi al akhlaq the warning against evil conduct because part of evil conduct is what? Suspicion. Being suspicious of your brothers and sisters, especially when it's unwarranted. And this is the topic here that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi wa alayhi wa sallam, is emphasizing is that when this suspicion is unwarranted, meaning there's no other surrounding factors to lead you to become suspicious, but instead you are being suspicious anyway, looking for mistakes, having a negative view of someone and trying to, uh, you know, find things and, and search and look for their uh, issues, then this is uh, problematic and this is 
a, a great sin. And this is why the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Beware of suspicion. And this is a hadith in Bukhari and Muslim. So what we learn from this hadith, Ben Uthaymeen mentions a, a, a big faida, a big uh, benefit before we get into the actual benefits that he uh, deduces from this hadith. And he mentions that the Zahir al-Hadith al-Amun, that the apparent meaning of this hadith is that it's general. Because the Prophet said, Iyakum wadhan. Beware of suspicion. So then, by saying that that's general, meaning that all suspicion is included there. Iyakum wadhan. Beware of suspicion. And however, Ahl Sunnah, from the Qawaid and principles of Ahl Sunnah, is they take the nasus, the text of the Book of Allah and the Sunnah, the Message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to complement that Islam is a full package and that is the master of the religion, that is the, 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 the foundation of the religion. In totality is the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the uh, consensus, ijma. But the main main masdar, which is without any dispute, is the Quran and the Sunnah. So that Ahlul Sunnah looks to the Quran and the Sunnah and looks how the Nasus explains one another. How something can be general, but another text may make it muqayyid, may restrict it, may define that text in a specific way. So that the adilla, which is the case in this hadith, that it was am at first, that we have other nusuls, which is from the Quran, the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which shows us to restrict that text. And the to give us that exact example, we go to Surah Al-Hujurat, verse 12, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fi Kitab Al-Kareem, Ya ayyuhal, Ya ayyuhal amanu, Ya ayyuhal amanu, Ajtanibu kathirum min al-dhan, Inna ba'd al-dhan, Ithum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fi Kitab Al-Kareem, O you who believe, avoid much of suspicion. Avoid much of suspicion. Ajtanibu kathiran min al-dhan. So beware of much suspicion. Inna ba'd al-dhan itham. Verily, some dhan, some suspicion is sinful. Letting us know, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said ba'd al-dhan, and he said ajtanibu kathiran a kathir and minavan, he said, beware of much of van, much of suspicion, and verily that some suspicion is sinful, letting us know that what we what it implies here and what we can infer from this text is that that there is a type of suspicion or a type of van which is not sinful. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Kathir min of dhan, laysa kullu dhan. He said, much of dhan, not all of dhan. And so that lets us know that's how we look at these texts. And that's how the texts explain one another. So we understand to put this text of the, uh, from this hadith on the scale of the Quran. And I hope that's, uh, that's uh, clear. To let us know how we understand dhan. And that's how the ulama, they look at the nusus, and, and this is why it's for Ahl al those mujtahideen, those people who, who know the Qur'an and its kawaid, who know the sunnah and its kawaid. You know, they know the principles of the Book of Allah, they know the principles of the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they know uh, how to, usul al fiqh, usul al tafsir, they know the sciences, and they know how to look at the evidence in the most appropriate way way to fulfill the, the maqsid, to fulfill the intent 
of those texts and those nasus, and that's very important. And that is a difference between ahl sunnah and ahl bid'ah. Although this isn't the time and place to talk in depth about those issues, because we want to stay on, uh, on in, uh, we want to be focused on our hadith at hand. So how do we look? So this is how we understand this text, because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, al dhan al hadith." Beware of suspicion, for verily suspicion is from the wickedest of speech. And this text shows us that that's restricted, muqayyid. That there is some vun, the implication from the ayat, that there is some vun which is not uh, an ithm, which is not uh, sinful. So it restricts this hadith. And Ben Othimin mentions that the type of vun or suspicion which is not sinful is that which we have a lot of evidence surrounding it. Maybe you don't have direct evidence, but there's a lot of circum circumstantial evidence which is surrounding it. So in that situation, then it, it is not suspicious. It would not be considered uh, the sinful suspicion. So meaning, if you have some two people, one person, he's known for being a, a straight person and known to be a, a, a person from Ahl Sunnah and on goodness and a righteous person. From the outward appearance, is what we know of them. Him or her. But he or she, uh, then someone comes along and then they're suspicious of them. I think so-and-so is doing such and such or so and so is working with so and so you know is he working with the innovators or is is doing this or you know whatever the case may be or is working with the fbi you know with, with intelligence agencies against the muslim you know whatever the case may be they they make suspicion but we know the origin of this person to be a person of righteousness and good conduct we don't pay attention in that situation this person is bringing unwarranted suspicion but if we have another individual who, for example, their asal is they've been known for doing wicked sins for many years. Okay, and this is in the situation of Muslims. This person we know is a, uh, a Muslim, but they've done some major sins outwardly. So they have a lot of surrounding circumstantial evidence from their background of why there may be a reason to be suspicious and then something happens around them which is a, a similar sin that they've always done. For example, Akramakum Allah, someone who has been known for zina in the community. And then someone comes up and says, this person has done such and such crime which is related to zina or whatever with me or against me or whatever the case may be. So here, you know, and there's a lot of circumstantial evidence. There's a lot of surrounding factors which kind of point to this person, but it's not direct. In this case, to make research into this, because this person has that history and has the circumstantial evidence around them to research into that, there's a, a, a very distinct possibility that this is true. So in that case, that would not be the suspicion which is sinful. And I hope that that's clear. And Allah knows best as far as that example. Getting on to the benefits of this hadith. This hadith, although it is uh, short and it's only part of uh, a longer hadith, shows us the tahdhir min dhan, The general warning against suspicion. So that's a good reminder for you and I not to be suspicious of one another. And have these negative thoughts about one another. And we already mentioned a situation where it wouldn't be, uh, you know, where there would be an exception to that. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us that hadith and nafs Yutlaq alayhi al hadith, meaning that when we refer to hadith and nafs, when you're talk uh, hadith and nafs, is when you have something internally 
this is like internal speech. I can't think of what we call this in English, but when you, like your subconscious mind is talking to you. And it can be in a negative way. Ben Othamin gives goes into detail about this. For example, uh, a person, and this happens to many people who have waswas who are afflicted with with this, that, and, and even ordin and other people, not meaning they're not ordinary, but meaning people who aren't afflicted necessarily with that, but uh, waswas comes to us all in one form or another, but perhaps a person is thinking and then they hear an ayat and then they think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they have an image in their head of what uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or they you know think about Allah in a way which is not befitting or the exact opposite they think of something horrible or haram that this is called hadith and nafs and as long as a person does not articulate that meaning that they don't speak about it and act upon it, then there's no sin on them. That's a ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because all of us, we get negative thoughts from time to time, weird thoughts that come out of nowhere. Maybe you put in some garbage in your mind. You're watching a lot of movies, watching TV and different things, and you get some weird thing. You remember a movie, and it had major shirk in it, and you think about that with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Somehow, you know, you, you know, or whatever the case may be, or someone said something to you and you just get this evil image, but you don't act on it and you don't speak on it. There's no sin on you. Walillah And we know this because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna allaha tajawaz an ummati ma hadathat. ما حدثت به أنفسها ما لم تعمل أو تتكلم. So this is a, a wonderful hadith, which is really good news for us. And this is a hadith in uh, uh, Bukhari. And the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, "Verily, Allah overlooks this." thing from my ummah, from my nation, that if they, uh, you know, if their subconscious mind, you know, they speak within their head, they whisper within their head, the waswas, waswas, or the, the haditha nafs, you know, the subconscious whispering or subconscious speech, as long, Allah, Allah overlooks that as long as they do not act upon it or speak upon it. So that is good, t glad tidings for us and letting us know, which is the point that Ben Rathameen mentioned here, that Haditha and Nafs, this subconscious speech, is also referred to as speech in the Shara, you know, in accordance to these Hadith. The Prophet Sallallahu referred to it as speech. And that goes back to the Hadith itself, uh, in which the Prophet Sallallahu said, Iyakum Wadhan, beware of suspicion, for in the van akhdabal hadith. For verily van suspicion is the worst uh, uh, is the worst speech. So here the Prophet ﷺ described suspicion as speech. You know that it that, that it's a type of speech because it starts in the heart and then it is acted out on the tongue by speaking about it, spreading the suspicion or acting on the suspicion. So, this uh, is a, a great benefit that we learn from this and, uh, and a rahmah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he forgives us and pardons us uh, for these things. And, and this, and as I mentioned, many people who suffer extensively uh, or, or you know, excessively from waswas, from the whispers of the shaitan, that they sometimes think uh, something wicked about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or something untruthful, or just uh, some sort of doubt. They read an ayat and, and a type of doubt comes to them or something. But then they kill that, they squash that. So it's very important that when this waswas comes to you, that you squash it, you control it. You knock it out the box. The shaitan came to you, or or your your suspicion, your own uh, uh, wicked suavun 
suspicion or or pessimistic speech or whatever you might want to call it that it came to you in a negative way crush it crush it and then move forward on positive and in belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala another uh, benefit of this hadith a last benefit we'll mention is the husna ta'lim rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the excellent way of teaching of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam and that comes in and as we mentioned in prior ahadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is that there were many times that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam mentioned the illa, mentioned the reason behind a sin or a hadith and this is from his excellent way of teaching because when you know the reason for something this helps you, this strengthens you more in Iman. So for example, when people ask for a fatwa or when they want to, 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 to know something, when that scholar or that alam or, or what have you gives you the answer and they give you the reason or they give you the, the evidence and maybe some reasoning, some hikmah behind it, you feel even more comforted. And this is from an excellent way of ta'lim. And this was the way of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. In the next hadith, hadith 1285, narrated Ma'ku bin Yasar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. I heard Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, There is no one whom Allah has placed in charge of people. And who dies while acting unjustly towards those who are under his charge, except that Allah has forbidden him from paradise. Mutafakun alayhi. This hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, and this hadith illustrates the importance of righteous leadership. And that when a person who is placed in authority, whether they be from the leaders of the Muslims, whether they be from the leader of a household, or whatever type of leadership position that a person is placed in that they have a responsibility to fulfill those rights of those people who they rule and those people under their charge and authority and that they should be just in dispensing uh, their responsibility. So in this hadith of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam we find many benefits and we find that also the emphasis on authority uh, is emphasized in this hadith as well as other ahadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam which show which shows that uh, this is am this is for anyone who's in authority and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in another hadith kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'ul an ra'iyatihi the prophet alayhi salatu wasallam said in a hadith in uh, sahih bukhari and uh, and also it's in muslim that all of you are responsible or shepherds and all of you are responsible for his flock meaning that you're all going to be held responsible for those charged that you're charged in authority over so being in a leadership position as also the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam mentioned in another hadith that it is not something to be necessarily coveted and desired to be the leader of people because with that leadership comes a responsibility and with that leadership it also means that you need to be ahlan lidhalik you need to be someone who rightfully should be in that position that you can be the leader that you can dispense authority and show that you're you have leadership qualities not everyone has those uh, those leadership qualities and from amongst the benefits of this hadith 
is first, we, this hadith emphasizes that the umur kulluha biyadillah, that all affairs are in the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All things are within the power and the hand biyadillah. No matter how minute or how large. And this is affirmed in this hadith in that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Ma min abdin yastari'hi yastari'hi Allah ra'iyya yamutu yawmu yamut wa huwa ghashun li ra'iyatihi illa haram Allahu alayhi al jannah The Prophet Sallallahu Alayhi Wasallam said, there is no one whom Allah has placed in charge of people. So the shahid here is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who has placed you in charge of others. That's in the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed you, has given you that responsibility as well. And that that is all the amur go back to Allah Azza wa Jal. Another benefit of this hadith is that this hadith also shows us that the one who does this uh, cheating, if you will, the ghash, the one who doesn't dispense this authority and take this charge seriously and who is uh, unjust, uh, towards those who they rule over that if they make toba for being unjust and they die then they are not threatened with this punishment because they made toba from this and that shows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is most merciful and pardoning tabaraka wa ta'ala another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us the obligation to advise those charged in authority over us uh, and that especially with regards to the leadership but even in the family even in the family structure all of the places where there's a, a, a there is an authority that the authority should be uh, advised. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us that the one who does not dispense the authority justly, you know, they don't rule over people with justice, that they have the threat of a severe punishment. Meaning, when you have a threat of severe punishment, meaning that that is a major sin. The fact that they are not ruling with justice, this is a major sin. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also... Uh, this rush is something in which Ben Othimin, he mentions that this rush is a, is a type of kufr. And the reason he says this is because that Jannah is prohibited according to the threat of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Jannah is prohibited for the one who does this Ghash, because the Prophet ﷺ said in this hadith, he said, while acting unjustly towards those who are under his charge, except that Allah has forbidden him from paradise, that the person who is unjust to those who they rule over, who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has entrusted them over, that they are forbidden from paradise. So that is a severe threat of punishment. 
and the threat of not entering paradise. Jannah is forbidden for them. And so for this reason, Ben Othamin says that this is a type of disbelief. And this is from the Vahir, the apparent meaning of the Hadith. However, we know that Ahl Sunnah, the belief of Ahl Sunnah, and of course this is the Madhab of Ben Othamin because he further goes into and explains this. He said, however, the Madhab of Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah is that hadith, uh, a hadith in the source like this that mention uh, uh, kufr for something which in its appearance uh, is not a type of kufr or is, uh, you know, the threat of a severe punishment like the prohibition of paradise or not smelling the fragrance of paradise and things like this, which are punishments for those who disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that the madhab of Ahl Sunnah is those who die on a, uh, in a state of Islam, Ahl Qibla, that those kind of uh, wa'id are a the nasus with the threat of punishment, meaning that it's a severe and major sin, but that they will not be in uh, eternally in the fire or internally punished, meaning Ahl Iman for the Muslims. That this is a threat of punishment because we have other nasus which, sh which show us, other texts which show us that even the major sinner, if they are punished, that they will come out of the fire. So the threat of punishment or not smelling the fragrance of Jannah ever or not entering paradise ever, that this is a threat of punishment, of the letting us know the severity of the sin, but we don't say that we make takfir of the person like the Khawarij and other extremist groups, but rather we say that these people, because this is the belief of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah, that they are tahtul mashiyatillah. They are uh, under the uh, will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If He wills, He will punish them, insha yaghfirullahum. If He wills, He will grant them forgiveness. And this is the i'tiqad of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also affirms Jannah. That Jannah exists, that paradise exists. And that is because the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned that the one who falls into this corrupt characteristic, and that's why it's in this chapter of those characteristics, which are mithmum, the akhlaq, the adab, which is uh, sinful in which should be warned against, that the person here is threatened with uh, not, is being forbidden from paradise, lets us know that paradise exists. Otherwise, there would be no benefit in mentioning that they will not uh, enter paradise. So that lets us know that what? This is Ithbat agenda. This is the affirmation that paradise uh, exists. And those are just some of the benefits of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم